Hello everyone, welcome back. So uh, in the last lecture we looked at uh, the correlation function, second order correlation function and we understood what it was and before that we had looked at the photon statistics. So uh, in this lecture I want to uh, introduce the quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay, uh, That's a very central idea in the treatment of quantum treatment of light and we would like to understand it. Okay, So why do we want to introduce this quantum harmonic oscillator? Well, if you think about the interaction of light with matter, there are, there are various theories, you know. The first one we have is a classical theory, right? The old, uh, you know, uh, electromagnetic treatment of light, which has been around for centuries now, right? And we also know how, you know, uh, we know how to treat matter, you know, classical mechanics. So if you look at classical theory, uh, matter and EM waves are both, you know, classical, you know, classical picture, Newtonian, right? This is Newton, Newton's laws, laws, and the EM waves are treated in terms of fields. This is my uh, classical theory. We have something else called uh, semi-classical theory, okay? Semi-classical theory, in this case, what happens is we start treating matter in the quantum perspective. More specifically, we talk of uh, energy bands. Okay. I'll treat matter using energy bands. And we all know why energy bands are required. If you don't have energy bands, you can't explain the, the optical properties, the electronic properties and so on. So we treat matter using quantum picture. Okay, This is quantum. But we treat fields, you know, in the classical picture, you know, very only the, you know, the EM waves are treated still as fields. Okay. Classical picture. When I say semi-classical, only one of the components of light matter interaction is treated quantum. And you would immediately guess, you know, where I'm going with this. So we have the full quantum description, wherein we will treat matter as, you know, energy bands and so on. So we'll treat matter in a quantum quantum picture. And electromagnetic waves as well, we will treat in a quantum fashion. So we will talk of photons and basically we'll talk quantum of light. Okay. So uh, there are some advantages to it. Okay. Of doing this, the full quantum description. And if you, do, if I talk to a general, you know, uh, student, undergraduate student, they find that, you know, the moment I utter the word quantum, they're uh, they're hesitant. You know, they have they're apprehensive because they are not really exposed to this, and uh, they try to think of that as something very very complex which cannot be understood. But that's not really true. I mean, of course, quantum mechanics is very deep and it it offers a lot of insight. But to understand some elementary aspects, you don't need to know all of that. You know, you need to understand a few things. Once we understand, and I think it makes our life simple. One of the things is you know particle in a box problem, and the other one is you know quantum harmonic oscillator. As far as quantum mechanics goes, uh, quantum optics goes, if you understand quantum harmonic oscillator, you understand quite a bit. And I think we will try to do that in the next uh, couple of lectures and this week and the next week as well. All right. So why are we interested in this? I mean, we know about the classical harmonic oscillator, right? An example could be something like a pendulum. I'll have a rigid support and then I have a mass which is suspended from a rigid support like a ball hanging by a string and if I push that ball, you know, it undergoes oscillatory motion and we call it simple harmonic motion. So this ball could be here or here, right? And we know how to describe this. I mean, we have studied this in school, essentially. So there is this oscillation of this mass M. So it undergoes simple harmonic motion, right? Essentially what is happening in this case is as the pendulum or the ball swings, the energy is moving between kinetic and pot kinetic energy is getting translated to potential energy and back, right? So there's continuous exchange of energy between kinetic and the potential energy components. That is what leads to the oscillatory motion. So if you were to describe the motion of, let's say, the position of the, the mass here in in a you know in an equation, you would write it as x of t would be some x naught, let's say sine omega t. 
okay so it's a sinusoidal motion simple harmonic motions are char characterized by the simple oscillatory motion right a sine form and we can also write what is the momentum momentum is going to be out of phase there is going to be some p not and then it's going to be out of phase with the position because as you reach the extreme position here the velocity decreases momentum reduces again it starts velocity starts increasing in position back and forth like this so these are two out of phase components and we know this very well from our you know classical mechanics probably some of you must have even studied it in school right so when we study newton's laws maybe derivatives you don't study but you understand the ideas of momentum and harmonic motion and so on so now uh, how do we describe this well we can describe it in terms of uh, position and velocity or you know momentum you can have various variables that describe this i mean this is one simple you know one single mass but the moment you have many masses like let's say you know 10 different particles or 10 different masses which are moving about the description of uh, the system in terms of forces becomes very very complicated okay so it is usually uh, in the classical mechanics as well in advanced classical mechanics they introduce the idea of hamiltonian which is essentially the energy so if you think about how the energy varies over time or you know versus position and so on we can describe the system that's much more uh, efficient way of describing it because the forces and the velocity and so on are vector quantities but energy is a scalar quantity and we can derive all the information is still present in that so usually in advanced classical mechanics we talk of hamiltonians and from there in quantum mechanics also we start talking about hamiltonians essentially that's the origin actually the, okay so now just you know if we were to motivate this if you look at this classical system uh i have my position so i can even simply define let's say uh, well, uh, momentum in the x direction for this case uh, this is also going to be a function of time so this is going to be mass times you know the velocity so that is going to be equal to uh, m omega x not cos omega t right so this is essentially going to be m omega p not so is that so no m omega x Wait a minute. So this x not I have x dot I have taken. So m omega x not sine omega t, uh, cos omega t. So if I call this as uh, m omega, let me just step back one moment. So what did I do? Like x m x dot. So x dot is basically omega x dot x not cos omega t. So this is my p right, not p not. This is my uh, well. I can define it as uh m omega into x not okay if i if i talk of p not because i'm trying to equate i'll take out the cos omega t i'll call this term as uh this i'll call it as p not so basically p not is going to be m omega x not right so this is how we can describe the classical harmonic motion so the mass and the the, the position and the velocity or momentum are interrelated right and uh, we can also write basically the energy of the simple harmonic motion oscillator as px square by 2m plus uh, half m omega square x square this is the energy of the oscillator did i do everything right okay so yeah this uh, basically this tells us that the energy is oscillating between the kinetic and the potential energies right this is the kinetic energy here kinetic ke and this is a potential energy and as you as the pendulum moves the energy is oscillating this is a simple harmonic oscillator and you might wonder why did i write it as px square by 2m and instead of you know some you, some of you must be familiar with half mv square plus half kx square right spring constant times uh, x square well you can write it in various forms but there is a there is a benefit of writing it in terms of these variables x and p we will talk about it in the later lectures not right now all right so now we have the simple harmonic uh, oscillator we want to now apply this to light why because you know we we know that light is basically an electromagnetic wave right and it has electric and magnetic fields and the energy oscillates between electric and magnetic components okay 
so we can we we believe that we can uh, describe it in terms of uh, oscillating electric and magnetic fields and the associated energies so we want to describe light as a harmonic oscillator how will we do that well consider this sort of a box which has some electromagnetic wave which is propagating in a certain direction z in this case and the electric field is in the x polarized x direction okay so what is shown is electric field so i can write e x of uh, z comma t right that i'll write it as some e not it's propagating in the z direction so i'll simply write it as sin kz and sin omega t so it's propagating in the z direction it has a sinusoidal dependence in time so immediately you know using maxwell's equations i can show that the magnetic field is now is going to be in the y direction and it can be described something of this form you know b not and it will be out of phase with the electric field so it will also propagate in the z direction and uh, it will have kz dependence and cos omega t dependence this is going to be my magnetic field and if you look at how the magnetic field is related to the electric field the the amplitudes are going to be related by e not by c so the magnetic field amplitude is quite small right so this is how you can describe a simple you know electromagnetic wave which is propagating in z direction okay now what is the amount of energy that it is taking okay we said that energy is going to oscillate right and the energy density energy density is going to be given by uh, let's say u something is going to be half epsilon not e square plus b square by 2 mu not this is my energy density right so now i want to know how much is energy stored and how it is oscillating between electric and magnetic components how will i do that well first look at you know how much is a total amount of energy present in the electric field to do that i'll compute this first term here so i'll take this basically e energy in electric component is going to be half epsilon not e square so now e i know how much is a e and i'll integrate it over this volume so this volume is now let's say uh, length is l and volume is going to be some you know cross section area times the length here for this box if you have such a scenario i can find because energy density and energy you know if you want to calculate the total amount of energy you will integrate it over this entire volume right so that will be half epsilon not cross section area is constant i'll take it out and then integrate e square from 0 to l e square is going to be e not square sin square kz and uh, sin square omega t dz okay so uh, omega t term will come out and then we will integrate it half epsilon not a e not square and then uh, sin square omega t and sin square kz if you integrate it it will essentially become you know uh, sin square kz i can write it as uh, uh one minus two sin square right so basically one minus cos kz or cos two kz two kz by two and then this is going to be integrated from zero to l dz so quickly you'll see that if you perform this integration your energy is going to be half okay one fourth half will come out epsilon not uh, a times l also is going to come because the first term is simply half right l by 2 the first term is so that is going to be volume times e not square sin square omega t okay this is my electric uh, energy in the electric field ouch sorry okay now similar analysis i can do for magnetic component and i can actually write uh, energy in the magnetic field magnetic field is going to be 1 by 4 and now instead of uh, volume b not square divided by mu not cos square omega t that's what is going to be okay and so the total amount of energy in the electro electromagnetic wave now has two parts one is the electric component and the magnetic component so i will write it as you know volume i'll take it out volume by 4 and uh, the electric component is basically epsilon not e not square sin square omega t plus 
v naught square by mu naught cos square omega t. Okay, so nothing really quantum so far, but we are simply stating that the energy oscillates between electric and magnetic fields. Okay, that's what my conclusion is. So that's it. Nothing really quantum so far. All right. So once we have it, this the the first steps. You know, we will make some uh, change of variables now. Okay. Uh, why we do that will become clearer in a in a short while. The first thing we we really got this energy in this form now already. Now we don't want to deal with uh, electric and magnetic fields directly. Okay, we want to make an analogy to the simple harmonic motion, right? Because we had p x square by two m plus half, uh, basically uh, m omega square x, right? We want to make that analogy. So to do that, we introduced what we call as generalized coordinates. Okay, generalized coordinates. coordinates the reason i do it is that you know if you think about it how will we define mass you know because uh, when we have a regular simple harmonic motion we talked about mass right mass of a uh, pendulum let's say but in electromagnetic wave we are not going to have any mass it's a massless thing which propagates at a speed of light so we will run into some issues so because of that we will define a generalized uh, coordinate q Which effectively is equivalent to you know it it will be related to x okay, and the generalized coordinate p again I mean it's related to p x okay. We will see what this relation is going to be okay. We do this so that we have basically uh, we have an analogy we compare it with let's say your e for a simple harmonic motion was p x square by two m plus half m omega square. X, right? This is what simple harmonic motion was classically. To make this analogy, we will do that. Okay. So now, how will I do this? Let's see. If you look at these variables, right? The way we've introduced. Let's first compute. I have, I'm given Q of t, right? So let's compute. Compute omega square into Q of t, and that is going to be equal to epsilon naught. Uh, omega square q square you compute that's better okay epsilon naught v by two omega square into omega square here into epsilon naught oh, sorry e naught sine omega t okay so this cancels out and immediately you see that the first term here in the energy of a uh, this one right this particular first term is going to be q square omega square. Okay, the first term in my energy is q square omega square. Okay, or rather, I'll write it as uh, instead of this, I'll say this is going to be equal to E electric. Okay. Similarly, now I'll compute p square. Okay, uh, if I compute p square, I'll see that it is basically v by Uh, two mu naught b naught square cos square omega t. So quickly that is equal to E magnetic. So now I am able to write the electromagnetic waves energy in terms of uh, these two coordinates. So basically generalized coordinates. So I'll write it as uh, half omega square. Okay, there is a half there anyway, right? Hmm. Okay, q square plus p square. So this is my electric and magnetic energies. Okay, just check out. I mean, there is a you know uh, half of e electric here. That's why they should this is half and this is half e magnetic. Okay, the way these are defined. So now, if we do this basically by using the generalized coordinates, we have avoided talking about the mass of a electromagnetic wave. Okay. But just by comparing these two terms, you know, let's say 
I'll compare this uh, simple harmonic motion and then uh, simple harmonic oscillator E P square half omega square Q square plus P square right this is my the new expression in generalized coordinates so if I compare these two comparing we'll immediately see that you know this whatever generalized coordinate I talked about P of T is related is related to P X by square root of M and similarly Q of T is going to be related to uh, Q Q square uh, Q square omega square is this right M omega square X so this is going to be omega square is anyway there so this is square root of M into X all right so this is the comparisons we are making okay and it will become clearer in the next lecture right now in this lecture I want to introduce this basic preliminaries and then it will become clearer why we are doing it but at least I hope you know I have convinced you that if you have a mass uh, electromagnetic wave it is not possible to define uh, mass so that's why we will go to generalized coordinates all right so with the generalized coordinates I have given you this uh, expression that you know this uh, energy can be written in terms of generalized coordinates okay so essentially what we did just to summarize okay, we had this electro electromagnetic wave which whose energy is given by this and now we derived an expression we said that this can be expressed as half of omega square q square plus p square this is what we did so we, we have this generalized coordinates that tell us and we also know that the q expression is essentially uh, similar uh, you know is similar to root of m into x whereas p is similar to px by root of m okay so these are the generalized coordinates now we can do one more step okay we can try to find out we know that b naught is basically we know that here b naught the electric magnitude of the uh, magnetic field is going to be e naught divided by c but i know what my c is if i, if I talk of b naught square this will be this c square and we know c square is 1 over uh, uh, 1 over mu mu naught epsilon naught so i'll write it as mu naught mu naught epsilon naught e naught square right so if i substitute it back in my original first term here first expression e is going to be v by 4 volume by 4 epsilon naught e naught square sine square omega t plus b naught square now is mu naught epsilon naught uh, e naught square divided by mu naught here and uh, cos square omega t okay so basically the whole thing comes out and v by 4 epsilon naught e naught square will come out into 1 essentially so this is my energy in the if I know my electric field at any point of time I can know how much is the energy that is present in the electromagnetic wave okay this is how energy will be in electric field you can similarly get an expression for magnetic field as well all right so that's it so basically we have introduced these basic elements and with that we will try to describe the electromagnetic wave okay how will we do that so uh, we'll talk the, about the details in the next lecture but for now i just want to quickly introduce one more idea so so far what we have done is we have introduced the generalized coordinates to talk about light as a harmonic oscillator simple harmonic oscillator okay now we also will talk about how to represent it in terms of a phasor diagram because you know any you know simple harmonic uh, uh, a harmonic wave can be represented in terms of phasors right you must have studied it in the introductory courses for example i am defining my electric field as e x of t right that we defined as e naught uh, sine k z and uh, sin omega t this was our description but you know this is assuming that the phase is you know phi is zero but in terms of you know if i can generalize my phase generalize phase and i can write it as e naught sin kz sin omega t plus phi i can i mean in the previous case i assume that the phase is zero initial phase but i can say that no i'll actually have a uh, i'll allow a phase change i mean i'll allow a general phase 
So if I do that, I'll quickly do, I mean, you know, we can, this is basically uh, electromagnetic wave which is propagating, right? So I can write it as E0 sine kz and I can expand sine kz and then sine omega t cos phi plus cos omega t sine phi and so on and then I can actually you know I'll change make a change of definition and I'll say that uh, well I mean I can represent this this is you know I can represent this electric field as a vector in the complex plane so I'll have the real part of electric field here and the imaginary part and there's a phase so I can write this as if I redefine I can redefine this as let's say uh, redefine as E0 if I do that because kz is constant at any particular point of time right I'm only interested in the, uh, the time variation so I'll just represent as E0 so this will be equal to E0 sine omega t cos of phi and uh, plus E0 cos omega t sin phi okay so essentially if I if I, I can define this as a vector in my complex plane with a uh, the real component here this is my real component and this is my imaginary component okay I can define like E1 and E2 this I can call it as some E1 and this is E2 so basically my E of T E of T I can write it as E1 uh, cos phi or rather yeah, plus E2 sin phi and I'll represent this as E1 uh, or I write it as E exponential i phi basically okay I can represent it in the complex plane if I do this okay so that's how I can get to this expression I can represent it there are the x component and the y component are different and I can represent it in the complex plane like this okay so essentially when my electromagnetic wave propagates I'll see that this vector is moving in the x y plane here in the real and imaginary axis okay this is what you would do in any you know circuits as well you know we have uh, wave you know any any lc lc circuit and so on you can talk of these phasors and then the phases you know voltage and currents we talk about in the basic elementary electric circuits wherein you know that similar representation for electric fields now all right so once you are representing as a favor uh, phasor we can actually expand this and we do this because you know in quantum optics it's very convenient to talk of uh, what are known as quadratures so quadrature essentially are components which are separated by a uh, phase of pi by 2 okay so in uh, in quantum optics it's easier to talk that way so we we talked about you know how we can represent it as a phasor now what i can do is again these are another term that i'm introducing x1 and x2 these are called as field quadratures these are called as field quadratures. Quadrature means they are, they are differing by a phase of pi by 2. So we'll define them as uh, this expression basically E naught V by 4H. I mean the expression is given here. So if you ask me, you know, how did you come up with this expression? I would say, no, this is a long historical process where people have tried various things. And it, look, it, it will turn out to be very convenient for us to talk of electric fields in this terms of these quadratures. And that is why we are doing that okay so we defined x1 as let's say epsilon naught v 4h cross omega whole square into in uh, e naught into sin omega t if you look at the amplitudes of this you know dimensions of this it can be instructive okay for example here i'm talking of x1 and x2 right these are two quadratures which are out of phase because one of them has sin omega t here and the other one has cos they're out of phase if i look at the dimensions of this are basically related to epsilon naught v and the e naught I can absorb into this. So e naught square divided by 4h cross omega. Okay. Now if you look at this term, right, this, this uh, here, if you look at this, these particular things, 
you will see that quickly we derive the energy expression in the energy is simply v by 4 epsilon naught e square right e naught square and that's exactly what you have here so if you look at the dimensionality of this this is going to be some energy divided by h cross omega which is again energy so basically these x1 and x2 are dimensionless quantities okay these are uh, dimensionless again this gives us a hint into why these are defined so if you look at electric and magnetic fields right we know that the magnetic field is smaller by the amplitude of the magnetic field is smaller by a factor of c so if you want to uh, de uh, describe a field oscillating between electric and magnetic fields on the same diagram it becomes very very difficult if i say i want to represent you know x uh, electric and magnetic fields right so instead i'll define in terms of quadratures so that i can simply on a sim on a same scale i can define both you know how the energy oscillates so now with this if you look at the the magnitude of it no or rather the the if i take x1 and x2 if i take x1 square and plus x2 square if i do this because i have sin and cos i'll simply do a square of it and then try to sum it up and i'll see that this will be equal to uh epsilon uh, epsilon not v by 4 h cross omega e not square right and i mean we can also uh, do some permutations by looking at the comparing the definitions we'll see that we had defined these generalized coordinates right if you look at this generalized coordinate in term x1 and x2 can be expressed in terms of even generalized coordinates if you do that and you do x1 square plus uh, x2 square x1 square plus x2 square that's going to be equal to omega by 2h bar uh, q of t square plus 1 by 2h bar omega p square and so i'll see that this is going to be h cross omega into uh, omega square q square plus p square so essentially uh, these relations you don't need to remember right now but it will become clearer what i want you to take home from here is that we can represent electromagnetic wave in terms of a phasor and that phasor instead of representing just in terms of electric fields i'll now represent it in terms of the field quadratures so i have my x1 quadrature and x2 quadrature these are two quadratures x1 and x2 and now any vector any electromagnetic wave can be represented on this quadrature plot x1 and x2 quadrature and the magnitude of the the, the vector in this quadrature space is going to be related to the electric field intensity by this expression here okay here is given expression right so this is my magnitude of the electric field electric field is related to the x1 square plus x2 square all right and so what is happening if an electromagnetic wave is propagating instead of talking about you know how electric field is changing as a function of time i can talk of how my field quadrature x1 is changing as a function of time so it is going from minus x1 to maximum x1 not to plus x1 not and it's just oscillating between that with the same frequency omega t so it's simply a convenient way of representing the the electromagnetic wave so far so nothing quantum about it you know so far we 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 gave a motivation saying that we want to talk about the quantum picture of light but we have not yet quantized it okay but we are just trying to introduce the basic tools okay so what did we do so we started out now with the simple harmonic motion we said that we we understand this very well and now if you have a uh, electromagnetic wave we can derive an equivalent expression for a simple harmonic oscillator and that is expression energy expression turned out to be this one here bottom so electric field oscillates between electric and magnetic uh, uh, sorry the energy oscillates between electric and magnetic fields and now we introduced you know is because we cannot talk about uh, mass for an electromagnetic wave we introduced generalized coordinates q and p which are related to the x and p for a classical uh, simple harmonic oscillator and we said that okay we have an energy expression that we derived in terms of q and p and we also introduced coordinates x1 or quadratures x1 and x2 which essentially are used to represent my electromagnetic wave so this is what we have done so uh, we'll again uh, remember this and we will try to come back to it every time we will develop these ideas in the subsequent lectures but for now i would like you to take home this idea that electromagnetic wave can be represented in terms of a quadrature plot wherein the vector length in the quadrature space will give you electric field times some constant we will talk about what that is 
and then x1 and x2 are the field quadratures which are out of phase by pi by 4 pi by 2 all right so uh, i hope this ans uh, this uh, was you know you followed what was happening we will come back again uh, to this again and again in this lecture this week and next week all right so thank you very much for your attention i'll see you in the next lecture bye